morning everybody it's randy with carkeology and i'm gonna do a little video about my newly acquired brubaker box so back when i was a kid following my dad around to car shows uh, we came across a car called a brubaker box now i want to say this was in the 70s i was probably about 10 years old or so and this little piece of literature i grabbed back then as a snot-nosed kid and i've kept it for 45 years or so and now i have my own brubaker box out there in the yard that's awaiting restoration uh and i'm really excited because now it makes sense why i kept this piece of paper for 45 years in any case, the Brubaker box uh, was a uh, little Volkswagen-based sports van of sorts that was designed by a gentleman by the name of Curtis Brubaker. And like many of the kit cars of the era, it's something that just went on to a Volkswagen Beetle platform. But what makes it different than the majority of the kit cars that are out there is obviously the extremely forward design, very modern, very unique, and the fact that the body was built in a, in a major quality fashion. A lot of the kit cars that are out there from the day uh, are really pretty junky on the when it comes down to the construction of it. They tend to be real creaky on the road and so on and so forth. Um, where the Brubaker actually has a steel frame within the body and um, and it's super heavy. Uh, something that we experienced in trying to put that onto its chassis uh, there just the other day. In any case, uh, I just recently got some more um, information on the Brubaker, uh, and I wanted to share some of that with you. Uh, I found a seller on eBay that was selling this little lot of literature uh, about the Brubaker. And these are from the earliest days of Brubaker when it was still Curtis Brubaker trying to sell uh, these cars. Now, everything was kind of fueled by his uh, prototype here, his show car being on the cover of Car and Driver magazine. Now, this was March 1972 when the Brubaker box hit the magazine cover uh, and the floodgates opened up. Now, when the article appeared in Car and Driver, uh, it went absolutely everywhere and the flood of orders started coming in. And unfortunately, it appears that he wasn't really ready for production uh, to keep up with that demand. In fact, there were some financial issues going on there. Uh, and as much as he tried, uh, from what I understand, it was a bit of a failure and that he really only produced three cars before shutting the door. And then after that happened, one of his investors, uh, a gentleman that ran a company here called Auto Mecca, he picked up where Curtis left off and tried to produce the car uh, in kit form to other owners, uh, as well as uh, perhaps turnkey cars as well. And that's where the majority of these cars uh, ended up coming from, was through this company Auto Mecca, including the one that I just recently dug out. So the rumor is that there were only about 28 of these cars built. Uh, the find of this particular one out here, uh, this is number 21 now on the registry. Um, so that leaves a very small number of them still remaining out there. And it's pretty shocking to me that that many survived. But I think there's a reason for it, and that reason is that it's such a unique and interesting car. Also, the construction of them, being as strong as they are, they've actually lasted the test of time very well. In any case, um, the article written by Gordon Jennings uh, was quite an interesting one. I wish I could somehow paraphrase it all for you, um, but uh, because he's uh, an amazing writer when it comes down to it. Uh, but the photographs and stuff are fantastic, you know, showing the versatility of the box, the luxurious interior, uh, the overall design and everything being so interesting, so fun, fantastic photos against that sort of futuristic backdrop. And uh, it's no wonder that the phone started ringing off the hook. 
In any case, this uh, batch of stuff that I just recently got in the mail uh, is some early paperwork from Brubaker Industries that uh, came out just shortly after the magazine article. So he put together this deposit agreement here um, and an order form so that you could order one of these. Uh, in here, let's see, this particular one is great. It shows uh, $39.95 as being the uh, total price for one. Um, let's see, this would be for a car that would be delivered in August or somewhere right around there. Uh, and the rules and uh, things here that he put in place um, were, were pretty interesting. You know, he provided unlimited mileage, one-year warranty, uh, working on insurance and that sort of thing. Uh, that was cash deals only, um, the, but bank financing will be available at some point. Uh, in any case, it uh, their showroom there in Los Angeles on Century Boulevard uh, was open for the public to see, and it looked like everything was really looking up. Um, options that were available, this sheet is actually nice on this order form. Here it shows the AM radio, for $64, AM FM 165, stereo tape player, which of course you'd have to go for, air conditioning at $525, automatic transmission at $265. I'm assuming that means an auto stick because the uh, automatic uh, VW was not available at that time. Uh, the carry-all compartment, which is apparently a uh, storage spot on the dash, uh, roof luggage rack, and the rear seat ottoman, which, of course, you've got to have for the full lounge routine. Uh, and the one thing that was kind of fun was, even though this was initially designed for for the youth, something that he thought surfers might really dig, uh, he decided that it was something that anybody would be into. So if you were a young, hip couple that wanted something cool to drive, if you were a pizza delivery guy that needed a good delivery van, you were Mr. Swanky here wanting a sports car that the box could be for you. If you're a mom with your kids, the Brubaker box could be for you. The young surfer, of course, the fisherman, you can camp in the thing. Introducing the Brubaker, you fill in the blank. So it is a car for everybody. It is something that I think was really planned to revolutionize the automotive scene and be attractive to a ton of different folks. Is it a car, a van, a camper, a sports car, a station wagon? Ask 10 different people and you're bound to get 10 different answers because the Brubaker is all those things, plus whatever else you might come up with. In any case, this is a fantastic piece of history on the early days of Brubaker. This catalog, the accessory price and order form, uh, the contracts and things involved with ordering one, uh, out-of-state information, all of that is fantastic, and I'm going to add that to the file uh, along with the magazine article from Car and Driver and my <laughs> brochure that I got when I was 10 years old. In any case, um, since when Brubaker uh, closed the doors, he had really just produced three cars. From that point on, it was all Auto Mecca, and this is one of the Auto Mecca cars. In fact, if you get right here, you can see this Brubaker sports van by Auto Mecca. And the story is that about 25 of the of these cars were built by an Auto Mecca. Now, I've had some people asking about the parts that were involved with the assembly of the car. So this car is missing the windshield, which is a big drag. But I have come to find out that the windshield is actually from an AMC Um and so I should be able to get that particular uh, windshield. Uh, I am missing the glass for this front corner, which I understand was something that was made specifically for the body, which is a bummer. Um, but uh, it's a lightweight car. I could probably get away with doing plexi here. It does have a slight curve to it. I might get lucky and find a glass place that could do something. I do have the, uh, the glass for this door. 
Um, I'm missing a part of the latch here to open the side door. And I've come to find out that the button mechanism that goes in here is actually from a Datsun Z car. Um, let's see, walking around back, the rear window is also missing in this car. And I understand it is from a Chevy El Camino. Uh, and so I've looked that up. You can actually get that rear window and its trim and rubber seal from some of the Chevy parts suppliers. Um, and so I can order up a brand new one of those, which is awesome. Um, the taillights, I believe, are from a Nissan or Datsun truck. Um, the Volkswagen engine and chassis and everything, of course, is an obvious one. These side marker lights were sourced from a Dodge van, from what I understand. Um, let's see, what other parts were sourced from other things? I think the uh, front turn signals or little fog lights here, um, those were also uh, from an AMC. Or that might be a Dodge item also, but I've got to hunt that down. I am missing one, uh, which is a drag. Now, this car has uh, a couple of interesting things I've not seen on other ones, especially this big opening here in the dash. So I saw in some of the literature and articles that they were talking about a cooler that was mounted in the dashboard. Um, and it makes me wonder if perhaps this was some prototype design for uh, an in-dash cooler. This is made out of a galvanized metal here. Um, it does have a couple holes in it for drainage. Uh, and obviously it had a door on it of some sort. There's this little molded in cutout spot here. So I think I will, I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to make a door for it so it matches over there. I might even play around with the cooler idea um, and fill it up full of ace, fake ice cubes and Coors beer cans or whatever. Uh, another fun thing that this car has is this full array of empty gauges. So you can see the little empty logo in there. Now those are really highly prized, the tachometer. Um, the Cowlick VW scene folks that are way into that stuff um, are, are spending kind of silly money on these gauges. A friend of mine told me that he saw one set of those gauges sell for about 2500 bucks, which is just nuts. I mean, will that, having these gauges in this car add that much value to it? Probably not. So I'm questioning, I'm going to do a little more research, see if it's worthwhile to either sell those gauges and put the funds into uh, the restoration of the car, uh, or maybe I leave them. Uh, another thing it has here is this empty steering wheel. Now this is a pretty rare empty steering wheel with the padded center. Um, that's one that you don't see pop up very often at all. It is a leather wrapped wheel, not the wood wheel, which uh, again is quite uncommon. And that's another thing that uh, I kind of question whether I keep it with the car because it was with the car, or if perhaps I swap it out to something that is uh, perhaps a little cooler looking uh, and use the excess funds uh, to go towards the restoration of it. Uh, and so that's something I'm going to look into. Um, let's see, roof panel. This center roof panel here is actually kind of neat. Now it's molded in up on the top. This is solid fiberglass all around here, but it was designed that, so that you could cut this out and make that a removable sunroof. And I think that's kind of a cool idea. Uh, might be cool to do that or even a, a slide back ragtop sunroof. Um, whether I'm going to do it or not, I'm not too sure. Uh, the little roof window here is actually kind of a cool thing. So it's almost like a sunroof. But uh, the story that I hear is that that was actually put there so that when you pull up to a stoplight, you can actually see the stoplight because the seating position is so far back into the car. Uh, if, if that wasn't there, there's no way you'd be able to see. Uh, visibility out of one of these things is really pretty cruddy. Uh, also, accessibility is a little odd uh, because the door is here on the passenger side, and that is the one and only door for this car. So you've got to get the door open, crawl over the seat, pass the shifter and all of that to get to the driver's side. It's also kind of fun to see the controls and stuff mounted along on the side, along with a spot for a radio, a little panel to cover wiring and that sort of thing. 
Um, I think there may have been an armrest of some sort that goes across the top there on that side. Uh, and I was talking with a friend of mine whose father had two of these back in the day. Uh, and he has told me that he has an armrest for it, as well as another piece for the back that I might, uh, might need. Um, the back here is a bit of a mess. Um, I've got some stuff piled up on the swanky rear seat, but the fiberglass shell that holds the rear seat upholstery is there and it's in good shape. I am missing the ottoman that goes back into this corner here. Uh, so I'm going to have to look at photos of that and see how I can replicate that. Um, in any case, overall, I'm pretty pleased with the condition of the body. Um, it doesn't look like it's ever had any sort of major accidents or anything. This is probably the worst crack here, uh, and that's on the textured front bumper, which is going to create a little bit of a challenge because doing a repair there, trying to replicate that little bumpy pattern to it uh, is going to be a little tough. Um, but I will give it a try. Uh, the front and rear bumpers do come off. They are separate pieces. Uh, I think there's a total of like 10 or 11 uh, fiberglass pieces that uh, that make up the whole body assembly. Uh, that I can pull off of there, uh, put it on the workbench, really work with it. I got some fiberglass repair stuff uh, this weekend, and I'm going to dive into it. Uh, the front bumper, right now I have it kind of loosely set in place uh, that welds to the front beam. Uh, and this is a fiberglass bumper with a metal strip within it uh, for strength. And these were originally finished with a faux wood look. So uh, I'm going to uh, put it back to that uh, so that it has that wood front bumper and I've talked with someone who is uh, looking at reproducing these cars and they actually have molds for the bumpers and they can mold another one of these so I have one for the rear and I need to talk further with them about doing that. Um, so there has been talk of reproducing this body. Uh, there's a company in Southern California here that uh, has a couple of them. Uh, they've done some molding and so on and so forth. They've had some stops and starts with it. Um, there is some question as to whether it'll ever happen, but uh, they are saying that they are still moving forward with it. Um, but uh, it sounds like it's a slow process and, and who knows what the future holds. Uh, let's see, rear bumper here, um, you can see along this edge, it's a little chipped up. I'm going to have to do some repair there, uh, get things kind of finished uh, a little nicer. There are some small cracks in the body. Uh, a lot of body work looks like it has been done to the sides. It's really quite smooth. Um, and I think with some minimal finishing on the painted portion there, uh, I can get that back to a paintable surface. Um, the one thing that's kind of interesting going around is I've looked real close and that right there, that metallic green, uh, looks to be the original finish on the car, which is really super awesome because in every single photo that I've seen of these, they are all in a warm color, either a, a maroon or an orange or a red or something like that. So I think doing one of these in a green uh, is going to be really super fun. It'll be a different look. And I like to have something a little bit different. Um, this rear piece right here, this goes down underneath the back bumper here. And as you can see, it's a little tweaked, but uh, enough of the material is there that I think I can probably get that back into shape. Uh, my friend that has the armrest apparently has another one of these as well. So I might see what he has before I dive into that. Uh, now, engine-wise, the engine that was in the Donor Dune buggy that we started with, this thing is seized up solid. We pulled the plugs. One of the cylinders had, was definitely full of water. Um, we're going to pull this thing out of here, knock it all apart, and see if we can save it. If we can, fantastic. If not, then I'll have to find another VW motor. Um, wheels that were on the Donor buggy um, are these US Mag 4 lug um, slotted mags which are perfect for the car uh, i love the slicks that are on the back here those are really badass but probably not something i'm going to keep on the car because who knows what the age are uh the front here the lee manhandlers 
in a, in a 14 inch are super cool. Unfortunately, those tires are really cooked. But I'm gonna take these wheels and polish them, uh, see how nice I can get them. Uh, I'm gonna find some good period style tires, maybe go with a red line tire or something fun or raised white letters again. Uh, and I plan on doing it back to its original green or perhaps a green that's somewhere in the same realm, uh, redo the top in black and then dive into the interior. Now, interior wise, when I got it, there were no front seats. Uh, I had these little bucket seats uh, left over from a dune buggy project. Uh, I may or may not use those. It might be nice to do uh, something a little cooler in there or a little more vintage, but uh, these really aren't too bad. Um, let's see, other things that are really odd. Let me see if I can get the phone in here. Now, normally the pedal assembly for the VW is really right down on the floor. But here on the Brubaker, they moved it up higher uh, onto the body. So I've got to figure out how that mechanism uh, now connects to not only the brakes, uh, but as well as the clutch and throttle uh, so that I can get all of that stuff in there and work the way that it needs to work. Uh, and then the other odd thing is your foot position, right? I mean, if you're used to having your heel on the floor to hit the gas pedal, how the hell do you do that with the pedals up there? So that's going to be an interesting thing to try and play with. Um, oh, here you can kind of see where the, the mechanism comes for the clutch and all of that. It ends up coming out above the tunnel. So I might have to um, reroute the cables or do something to make that work out. Uh, there are, is some damage down in the corners here as well. I think this body was off of uh, a chassis for quite a while and in moving it around some of the bottom corners and things uh, sustained a little bit of damage uh, so i'll do some fiberglass work in there to improve on that so it's a cool project it's one that i'm really super excited about i can't wait to dive into it i'm going to start looking for all of the parts uh, the amc hornet windshield the el camino rear window those are going to be main things because i want to be able to seal the thing up um, get some plexiglass to do the top window and the side window here uh, dive into the bodywork, the repair of the fiberglass. Uh, I'm thinking I might, just for doing it quick and doing it fun, uh, do a vinyl wrap on the side of them of the car um, because there's a lot of great colors that are there, and I think it might help with some of the real fine cracks that end up happening with a uh, with a fiberglass body like this. So. Um, you know, you can do a lot of work on these things to, to paint them. And then that stuff, those stress cracks end up coming back through. Um, so I'm thinking perhaps the vinyl wrap might be not only a quick way to get some color on this, um, but also one that might help hold it together, uh, for a longer period of time. You know, this isn't something I'm going to spend a lot of time driving around. It's going to be a show car. It's going to be something that comes out on sunny days. Uh, and the fun part of the wrap, too, is you can also change it. So if I get tired of it being green on the outside, well, then maybe I can do another wrap that's kind of crazy van style with a airbrushed uh, dragon or something on the side or, you know, give it a funny name like Pandora's Box or something to that effect. In any case, that's the walk around of the Brewbaker Box project. A little bit of the history through the paperwork that I've found. I know I've rambled on crazy here. It's been over 20 minutes of me just plain talking. Um, but hopefully it gets you as excited about the project as I am. And I hope you all follow along as I dive into it and transform this dusty relic into the show car that it really should be. Thanks for watching, everybody. Keep on digging them up and driving them. Bye-bye.